Hello world, this is Craig. This is the second of the videos on what's going on inside these magnetic devices to get them to actually work. And in this one, we're going to talk about two things. The first is given that these bubbles are in this two dimensional plane and they're free to move anywhere in this plane. The first question is how do we constrain them to be in certain places and, and to be organized in this plane rather than just randomly distribute themselves equally across this. So that's the first question is how do we constrain their motion in this plane? The second question is, once we've constrained that motion, how do we move them so that we can keep them in the racetracks and get them over to a detector and get them from the generator into that racetrack? So those are the two things we're going to talk about today. And we're not going to get deep into the physics, even though the physics behind magnetic fields is extremely interesting. We're not going to get very deep in it. We're going to use basically just common knowledge. So the way they do this constraint is, let's say this is our two-dimensional plane, this white piece of paper. They pattern on top of this a permeable material, and in this case they use an alloy, it's called permalloy, so it's a very highly permeable magnetic material. And we know that a magnet will stick to anything that is permeable. Now the geometry is a little bit different because this magnet is sticking to the side of this, but in real life this permalloy is on top of the two-dimensional plane, so it's more akin to this, where the magnet is stuck to the bottom, and the magnet's actually staying in the shadow of this permalloy. And it does that because it minimizes its energy of the magnetic field if the field can go through that permalloy. So basically, once it's stuck to the bottom of that, it's happy being anywhere in the bottom of this shadow of this permalloy material. So again, this permalloy material is on top of the two-dimensional plane. These bubbles are moving around and they can be anywhere. But as soon as they come upon a piece of this permalloy, they will stick underneath it to that shadow. So that's how we constrain these bubbles. We do that by, they do that by depositing on the surface a pattern of magnetic material, in this case, permalloy. And this is what a pattern looks like. Not so much anymore, Intel abandoned this, but this is what the first pattern looked like when they developed bubble memories to begin with, and it was called the T-bar pattern. And we'll use this to show how we move the bubbles along this material. All right, if we look inside a bubble, this is the uh, 7110A, so this is the one that's the 20-pin version instead of the leadless version that goes in a socket. But basically, any of these bubbles, they have wrapped around them in one direction a coil of wire that they use as an electromagnet, and that coil can create a magnetic field in that direction. Now, the drivers that are running that coil are these H-bridges, so they can change the polarity, so they can run a magnetic field in that direction of any strength, or they can go all the way around and they can have a magnetic field in that direction of any strength. We have one for the X and one for the Y. And by varying the relative currents through these two H bridges, since the magnetic field is additive, we can create a net magnetic field that is in any direction, anywhere in that 360 degrees. Okay, and so this is called the rotating magnetic field. So if you, so if you look in any of the literature, you'll see that there's two magnetic fields involved in this. The first is the bias field, and that's the one that we created by putting a permanent magnet on the bottom and a permanent magnet on the top. And that creates a field in the Z direction. And it's that field in the Z direction that caused all of the domains to form these little bubbles. And that's just a permanent magnet that stays at that strength and forms these bubbles. But these two magnets, we have one that's in the X direction, one that's in the Y direction. And that allows us to form this rotating field that's in any direction in the XY plane. All right, so we've got that XY field. Now let's represent that as this pin that has a orange end. Okay, so this is our magnetic field, and I don't care which is north and which is south, but they're just uh, this is a magnetic dipole, and this is our magnetic field that is rotating in the XY plane due to those two electromagnets that are wrapped around the bubble device. The second thing that we learned when we were little kids is that we can take something that is permeable. And by itself, it may not be magnetic. It may not be able to pick up something because it doesn't have its own magnetic dipole. It's not, a, it's, not, it's not magnetized. But I can induce this to become a magnet by putting it in the presence of a magnet. Once I do that, I put this and put it in the presence of a magnet, now it becomes a magnet by itself. And if I take that magnetic field away, it's no longer a magnet. Okay, so I can induce this to become a magnet. 
Now we're going to utilize that in our little example down here. So this is our rotating applied field from our two coils. And we're going to say that if it's in that direction, it's going to induce a magnetic dipole in these permalloy materials. So it's going to induce it both in the bars and in the T's. And it's going to induce a dipole moment that looks like this. So now we're going to say that when this is going in that direction, all the orange Skittles want to go up. And when it's in that direction, all the orange Skittles would want to go down. So let's start out like this. Each of these are little magnetic dipoles now. And so we would have magnetic field lines that are coming out of here and come back around into the tail of the T or out of the top of the bar and into the bottom of the bar out of here. So these are each now induced magnets. All right, this is our bubble. So the red Skittles is our bubble. And in this case, we're going to say that the red Skittle is attracted to the orange end of a magnet. Okay, so the red is attracted to orange. And because he sees this permalloy shadow that he can reduce his energy, he will go underneath that permalloy material. So again, the induced magnet is in the permalloy, which is on top of the two-dimensional plane. This little bubble is a domain that is in the two-dimensional plane. But nonetheless, they still see each other and they're attracted to the orange end of the magnet. Right now, the way that he's set up, he's pretty well attracted to this top bar of the magnet pretty equally. He doesn't really care where he is. There is a little green here that he's not attracted to, but remember there's a green one over here on the left-hand side that he's not attracted to either. So that, those will cancel out and he's pretty happy anywhere along the top of that bar. But now let's rotate our magnetic field a tiny bit. So let's go, so our magnetic field is now canted at 45 degrees. What we're going to see is that these orange ones want to follow that magnetic field. And eventually, as this gets strong enough, a green one is going to come up and be on that end of the crossbar. So now they're repelling each other. And this is getting a net magnetic field that's coming out of this end of the bar. And it's some of it's coming down here into the bottom of it and some of it's going to the other end of the crossbar. But the net upshot is that this bubble now wants to move with those orange ones and go closer and closer to this end of the bar. All right, now we get to where we're 90 degrees now all of the green ones are on that end, all the orange ones are on that end. Green ones there. And even on this little bar here, these are gonna be separated. They're gonna be separated you know, right to left. But just because of the dimension of this, this magnetic field can't get the accumulation that it will on this bar that's going in the favored direction of the applied field. You know, he's trying to separate left and right across this small dimension. So these aren't going to get that far apart. What happens is that this then is not the most influential magnetic field in this system. We can see that now in this case, this bubble is very happy being here. He's very attracted to this end of the bar. He's repulsed from that end of the top of the T. He's repulsed from this end of the top of the T. He's pretty happy right there. We continue turning our magnetic field. We're down to this point. We can see that we're going to get to the point now where the green ones will want to start to distribute themselves and populate across the top of the bar while the orange ones will start to go down to the base of the T. Okay, so we get into a situation that looks like this. When we're at the full 180 degrees from where we started, now the green ones want to be up there, orange ones want to be down there, so all the oranges will move down here. And as we start to pass through this, you can see what's happened. This bubble has found himself on the end of this crossbar as the magnetic field is crowding in on him. And so he has a choice. He has all of this field down here that he is being repelled by. All of his friends, the orange Skittles, have left. And they're down here at the base of the T. He does have some friends over here on the bottom of the bar that he would like to be attracted to. So he's got a choice. Either he can jump down here and go to the base of the T, or he can skip this gap. So he can jump that gap completely and he can join the bottom of the bar. Well, ideally, if everything here is designed and the dimensions are correct, that's what he's gonna do. He's going to stretch himself across that bar so that he will go out from underneath this permaloy material over to underneath the shadow of that permaloy material. And he will do that because he's been forced off by these, by the induced field in each of the T's. 
Now he's stuck here. He's not going to go over to this T because this T is every bit as repulsive to him as the top of that T was. So he's now in a, another potential well. He's very happy being here. And if we stopped rotating the field, it would stay that way for decades. But let's keep rotating the field. So we're going to go a little further. And you can see as we move our rotate, as we move our field further, now the greens are going to start to want to go to that direction. Oranges are going to want to start to come up here. We're going to get a little bit of a separation in this bar. We can see that by the time we get to the full 100, and, or by the, the time we get to the full 270 degrees, now we have all of the attractive orange ones on the left sides of the cross member. This red one again will jump this gap so that he can be underneath that permaloy and closer to this end of this induced dipole moment. This continues to go until we're back to the zero where we started from. And now by the time we get down there, all of these guys have moved down to the bottom of the T. The reds are distributed across the top. The greens are in the bottom of the bar. So he's now repulsed by this bar and attracted to this T. And so that was what caused him to do that jump. And now he's somewhere across the top of this T. He's fairly happy where he was. And this is just exactly where we started from at the zero degrees. And we continue, we rotate again, and he winds up jumping onto this bar, and then he jumps onto that T, and then the next bar, the next T, and the next bar, and so forth. So you can imagine that the dimensions on this are very critical. If we, if the gap is made too large, he won't jump the gap. Instead of jumping the gap, he will follow this down, he will follow the orange ones down to the bottom of the T, and then we have the bubble on the wrong side of the T. He's going around the T rather than jumping the gap. So the size of the bubble compared to the size of the gap is a critical dimension. The spacing on the bubbles is also critical. It looks like technically we could have a bubble on each of these T's, but they don't do that. They have a bubble on every other one of the T's because the bubbles have to be spatially separated as a part of making sure that they transfer properly with each rotation. So that means it actually takes two rotations of the applied magnetic field to get a bubble in a particular position because this would be one stable state he would then move over there at 360 degrees and he would then move over to this one at 720 degrees so if we took a snapshot of this we would find that there's only a bubble on every one of the t's and of course that's only if that bit happens to be a logic one if that bit's a logic zero there is no bubble there's nothing happening there's nothing moving no domain going by as this rotates now as i mentioned the T bar system is the original design, and that's how it was originally figured out how to move these bubbles. But since then, you can imagine there's a tremendous amount of work making sure that this is all proper and how to reduce these dimensions and make these bubbles very stable. So after the T and bar design came the modified C design. And then the design that Intel decided to settle on was this modified Chevron. So you can see it's a very complicated design, and there's a lot that went into this but it allowed them to make the geometries as small as possible, make the bubbles as small as possible, and still get very dependable movement of the bubbles from chevron to chevron. Okay, so hopefully that explains why the bubbles are constrained to a certain place in this two-dimensional magnetic plane and how we move them along this plane. So this basically is just, you know, three little segments out of the entire racetrack that has 4,000, or actually since it holds 4,000 bubbles, it's got 8,000 segments around this racetrack. And every time this rotates around, the bubbles just go from T to T to T all the way around this racetrack, and they will do that forever. Anytime that we stop rotating that, that magnetic field, the bubbles just stop exactly where they were, and again, they'll be stable for decades. All right, well, that is what I wanted to cover in this video. In the next video, we're gonna talk about how we actually generate these bubbles so that we get them into this racetrack and begin with. All right, well, I appreciate you watching. If you have any feedback, let me know. Talk to you later, bye-bye.